And shit, folks. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to another episode of your favorite travel podcast, Travel and Shit, where I your host, D. Carrie, have an experiential conversation about the nuanced ways that travel intersects with regular life. Um, starting at the top, because I said I was gonna mention it. Update on my hobby, Wanda. Thank you for the kind words. First of all, I had a fan fucking tastic birthday, guys. Um, thank y'all so much for the birthday love. Please, please, please keep the plays coming. Tell a friend and let me know what your favorite episodes are. Share your favorite episodes on Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Tag me. Would love to see it. Um, but update on the hobby. So I mentioned, uh, during the episode, the return after I took a little, um, a little holiday, took a break. I started playing video games. I bought myself, um, a switch for my birthday and um started playing zelda and i mentioned that i died in uh nashville it was in nashville yeah and that was the last time that i played the game i actually turned it on for the first time since nashville and i just want to make sure it powered on it's fine haven't played again still a sore loser i'm really not looking forward to starting all the fuck over again um so yeah, that's quite frustrating. Uh, so I know this about myself. I tend to go through ebbs and flows of, um, interests and I'm hoping that I haven't completely, um, lost my interest in video games as a hobby because I spent so much money on that shit. But what I will say is I am trying to use it as a catalyst to exploration and using not giving up on the video games as a parallel for me, not giving up in other endeavors, um, especially in a sense and in, in a small world where it has absolutely no consequences. If I fuck up there, it, it means nothing. So just trying to get used to uh, not being good at something from jump has been very frustrating. And I, um, I'm starting to see that in other realms. So it is a, I don't want to say it's a labor, but it's one of those things that ended up being, I don't want to say deep, but it ended up being a little bit more than I expected it to be. So I'm kind of tap dancing around how I want to handle that. Do I really want to, uh, persevere, find some fun outlets and don't let it get you down Or do I just want to say, okay, so I'm not a video game girl. Don't know. But that's the update on that. Um, That's where the hobby stands. Speaking of something that um, was a little bit behind us, jumping into this week's episode, few new cycles ago, if you will, there was a little bit of um, word from the bird, as I like to say, I spend most of my time on... Twitter. That's where most of my social media talents lie. Um, and that's a uh, travel and shit, T-R-A-V-E-L, the letter N, S-H underscore T. That is, um, oh, that's, that's my handle on Twitter. I am starting to dabble a little bit more in TikTok. Very unfluent not necessarily looking forward to being fluent, but I think I'm maybe like six videos away from probably buying something. And I don't know how I feel about that. And it's probably going to be that shower scrub thing, but, (laughs) um, I'll report back on that. But back to what I was saying, uh, word on the bird, there was a little bit of conversation around people visiting some cities and then being totally disgusted with what their experience was. Two in particular were um, some place, I wanna say there was some girl that was in 
Tokyo or was it Japan or something? And she was complaining about all the bugs, that there was nothing here, that it was supposed to be this grand, beautiful, um, scenic, um, space that had historical context, yada, 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 yada. And she got there and she's like, there's nobody here. There's nothing going on. It's all these bugs. Like I'm hot. And it was just complaints about basically being outside. Cool. Didn't meet your expectations. Right. And then there was another video of a, um, I don't know how they identify, but, um, a person in Paris and they were complaining about it being dirty. It's smelling, um, you know, homeless people, dingy, not real, like exciting and bright. And it's like, okay, it's a city. People live in cities. Um, I, I wrote about it in my, uh, recent Taji article. If you want like a little mini bite of the conversation and, uh, the direction that I took it there, um, that will be available next quarter. It'll be, um, T A J I M A G dot com. Taji com is the publication that I write for. I am their travel contributor. And, um, Every quarter, I add a little razzle-dazzle, same way I do here at the podcast. It's a little truncated, little bite-sized dose of me and my um, introspective lens on travel and regular life shit in words. Um, So check that out if you do feel so inclined. But um, in that conversation of going someplace and being disappointed in the experience not matching what social media or whatever your preconceived idea of the place was in the spirit of that I heard some rumblings of a uh, Emily in Paris syndrome so I've never watched the show unfamiliar I can't necessarily say that I have heard anything about it that makes me feel like it's up my alley or in my wheelhouse. Um, So I can't say that I necessarily have much interest in watching it. So full transparency, we're starting there, right? However, the sentiment is like, if you look up on Urban Dictionary, Emily in Paris Syndrome is basically expecting Paris to be the romanticized city that life has been telling us since we were, you know, forced upon this world through birth, um, that Paris is this beautiful romantic city. And that's not just it. Apparently, and according to the little links that I found, mind you, this was not a scholarly search. Let's be clear about that also. This is a good old Google, dry ass Google search. But according to the Google search, Paris syndrome is a legitimate illness studied by quite a few, I think, psychiatrists, not psychologists, but it is mostly Japanese citizens or people from Japan that, because I can't necessarily say that they're all citizens. I don't know what everyone's citizenship looks like. And I don't remember exactly the phrase that they use in the article or on the link. Um, But people from Japan are generally the ones that express physical ailments in response to being totally like surprised about what Paris actually is and it not matching the idyllic vision that they had. Didn't think it was anything that had like physical symptoms that matched it, but um, apparently so. But essentially destination not matching up to its height. So it got me thinking, thankfully, I've never had any um, illnesses while traveling, except for that time that I was in Thailand and it was basically bubble guts. Don't know if it was gas, nausea. I didn't know which way it was going to come from. And of course, I left everything because I travel with a bag of everything, Imodium, uh, Tylenol, Excedrin, Aleve, Pepto, Benadryl tweezers, alcohol pads, the razzle and the dazzle. Um, get into this golden hour. The sun is setting while I'm recording. So, you know, in case you're curious about how this beautiful brown skin looks with the sun setting, um, you know, check it out on the YouTubes link in the description box. If you feel so inclined, 
But um, yeah, so Thailand was the only place that I ended up um, feeling ill. And I had left all those pills that I mentioned in my little um, makeup size bag, my little travel kit in the room. I didn't bring that with me while I was out and about in the street. And of course, my stomach started flipping on me as soon as I got into the taxi. But thankfully, the taxi driver kind of got a gist of what I was saying and took me to a pharmacy where then I then had to try to navigate through um, not speaking the language. And she gave me like probably little Imodium tabs. I actually still have them in my closet. Um, I would never take them, but it's just, it's like a little souvenir. But um. And so thankfully I've never experienced any actual physical illnesses, but I was very surprised to see that there are people that do experience such a strong reaction to a place not matching their conception. So I decided to go through my past travels and wonder, have I ever been victim to really going in with a preconceived notion and being completely, completely the fuck thrown off. So let's start with the first place that I will say I um, had to have like a come to Jesus moment about, and it was Bermuda. I don't know about you other um, 80s babies, children of the 90s, um, but uh I was terrified of the Bermuda Triangle. I don't know. I cannot point to one particular thing that it may or may not have been that set my little brain off. But baby, I was terrified. My grandparents would cruise a lot because retired life, you know, um, don't we all wish that we could be so free? Um, shout out to all you retired folks. Hey, ma. My dad. And I'm pop. Well, hmm, no more pop. That's sad. Sometimes you forget. You just jump to it. But um, hey to my retired listeners. Um, but they would vacation cruise all the time, and I was so worried about them getting sucked into the vortex that was the Bermuda Triangle. Like terrified. So every time that they would come back from their cruises, low key inside, I was just like didn't get them. Um, and so for years it was just like, what if we ever have to fly across the Bermuda Triangle? Like, do we have to fly across the ocean to get to family reunion? <clears throat> Excuse me, in Georgia. Is that part of the flight path? Like there, I was irrationally worried about whether or not I was going to have to come into contact with the Bermuda Triangle as a kid. And so oddly enough, I didn't, well, it's not, I don't want to say oddly enough as if the two had anything to do with each other because they absolutely didn't. I got over it, but I definitely wanted to touch on that because I also haven't think, I don't think I have heard anything about the Bermuda Triangle, if you will, since I was a kid. I don't know if it's something that you kind of like grow out of hyper awareness to, or if it's just if it really was like a cultural thing and it was just of the times, has it been debunked? I don't know. Maybe that's something that I'm going to dive into, but Bermuda was fucking beautiful. There was nothing scary about it. Um, had a great freaking time. I often suggest Bermuda as a first solo destination, especially for um, travelers coming from New York, tri-state area, Eastern seaboard, because it's close. It's like three hours from New York. So it's faster than getting to a lot of different States. Uh, the only caveat is your, I don't know what the, the word for it is like your taken team. If somebody needed like your go team, if somebody needed to come extract you or if someone needed to come save you, they're going to need a fucking passport. That's the only difference. But the flight there is a lot, you know, faster than a flight to a lot of different States when you're coming from New York. So that, um, that's one place that I will forever suggest to solo travelers or new travelers um, for something to kind of get your feet wet in terms of just stepping into the travel sphere, if you will. But yeah, I was terribly terrified of the Bermuda Triangle and anything Bermuda related because, of course, little me didn't. I was science inclined, but. I always let my little, my little heart ran ahead of my head and I was so scared, but thankfully 
it came of nothing. Um, mini note, shout out to Notion, totally unsponsored, but just, I am trying to learn new softwares and this is another aside. I'm trying to learn new softwares and there are so many things within the world of this podcast to be done, to be dabbled and experimented with and, you know, try this, try so many different things. And so every time I try to, um, tinker around or do something else, again, I'm reminded of not being good from beginning. And I think that that's another thing where, again, (laughs) travel is so much more than vacation. It's one of those things where here's the parallel, right? I mentioned it. I started mentioning it earlier and I wasn't sure if I was going to find the link, but so this episode in particular is a perfect one. And I'm hoping that I can articulate exactly how it is in my brain so that it makes as much sense to you guys as it does to me. So part of this little rabbit hole caveat aside, if you will, that I'm hoping is near and dear to y'all's hearts by this point, because baby, I'd be trying to stay on task. I even have a little, um, outline the, all of it, but I just be having to get it off my chest and have to get it off my heart and share it with y'all. But the same way you have an, an expectation, a vision of what something is supposed to be in terms of your destination, right? Paris is so beautiful. It's romantic. It's just, Oh, we, we, whatever, whatever. I don't speak not a lick of uh, French, y'all. I don't speak a lick of nothing but English, honestly, to be honest. But um, I, I, way less French than I would be proud to admit as someone who lives in a very metropolitan city such as New York where thousands of languages are spoken around me. Anyway, again, another digression. Apologies. You have an anticipated idea of what something is supposed to look like. Travel destinations, locations, arrival, disappointment. I too have a struggle, a point of seeing how I am supposed to behave or how something is supposed to work or how good or not I am supposed to be at something. And then when I endeavor, when I embark upon something and try it, does not compute, doesn't connect. I it doesn't match because I go into a software or you watch a little demo, you watch a little tutorial on YouTube or whatever ad you saw that sold you on, oh my God, this platform is going to be the game changer. It is going to fix the problem and solve the day. And then you get into the actual application after figuring out how to download it because baby, I am learning. I am feeling as if I am less and less tech savvy, but even downloading something onto my Mac, it's so confusing sometimes because it's not something that I do all the time. And it's clear as user-friendly as Mac is honestly doing all of school life on windows and PC, that is much easier for me to download something on, even though I've been team Mac in terms of home life since at least 2008. But again, the parallels, real expectations don't necessarily match the practice. They don't necessarily match when you are in the throes of things and you're in the thick of it. So (laughs) this travel and real life connection for today is the vision does not necessarily match the product, what I ordered versus what I got. But at least in this case, there is something in between and I could at least grow through the process of trying to learn the software. There is no in between, if you will, at least I haven't explored or discovered it yet, but I can't necessarily put my finger on an in-between um, between your idea of a destination and then actually arriving at a destination uh, the same way that I can see the parallels or I can see the comparison between your idea of what a new thing is, whether that be a hobby, whether that be a program, whether that be a job, whether that be whatever, and then your actual experience of that job, uh, project or software, whatever. There is at least an in-between there. I am at least in an in-between stage of, okay, this is the software. This is what its capabilities are. And then this is what my actual skill level is. I at least have an in-between there. So while I don't necessarily have an idea of putting my finger on that in-between in terms of travel, 
I could at least get into the experience and tell you how I felt about it. So continuing on with my little list here, uh, LA, I had no real picture of what Los Angeles, California looked like, except for in the fucking movies. And by in the movies, my main describer, my main driver was pretty woman. Loved the shit out of that movie. I would always confuse, um, Sandra Bullock and, um, girl, um, what's, um, the, uh, the, the woman that actually played in pretty woman. What's her name? I see your face, not Sandra Bullock, but her, the woman from pretty woman. It's not Nicole Kidman because that's the name that keeps coming to mind right now. Uh, Julia fucking Roberts. There we have it. I would always confuse Julia Roberts and Sandra uh, Bullock. Um, heart goes out to Sandra Bullock, who uh, recently lost her partner to ALS, apparently. Um, I know that that's definitely, definitely hard. Uh, I've love her down and uh, she's given a great deal of entertainment to me. So my heart goes out to her and her family. Um, but I would always confuse the two of them. But Pretty Woman was one of those movies that if it came on, I'd I'd watch it. And I was absolutely enthralled with, wow, okay, LA, it's gritty, it's rough, but it's also gorgeous and glamorous. It's giving the way they portray um, New York on TV. New York is also one of them cities where everyone loves to say how if you make it here, you can make it anywhere. And it's glitz and glam. And that's where all the movers and the shakers are, honey. That's where it's at. Love New York, gang, gang. New York till I die. However, get me out this bitch. I'm ready to go. I would love to live someplace else, but life is lifing. And (laughs) there are things that are keeping me here. That being the case... I had no real, um, how should I put this? Another thing about what you see and what you expect that needs to also be top of mind for like your experience, like what you order versus what you get. Remember what you're paying for in terms of what you order, right? So the idea, the picture, whatever it is that you, anticipate experiencing, right? Is it within your budget anyway? So if you're expecting luxe, rich, you know, really quality, you know, uh, chef's kiss experiences, depending on where you are, you have to really consider what does your pocket say? What does the billfold say about the experiences that you're going to be able to attain? Depending on what your currency is, shout out to, where was it? Sri Lanka, I want to say, and Croatia. Doing pretty fucking well on those Apple charts there. Shout out to y'all there. Pleasure to be in your ears. Um, But if you are expecting lavish and luxury, I think it's fair to expect that you've got to spend lavish and luxury dollar. And by dollar, I mean, whatever the currency that you make your money in um, and how that plays for where you're going. I, as an American, get paid in American dollars. And so that is what I spend when I travel. In some countries, it does me favors. Like it does very well and it translates well. It translates well. It it will translate well. Translates well. That's not inappropriate usage. It will convert well is probably the better way to put it, but the dollar converts weight, the conversion rate, all that jazz, right? So I can get some really nice shit in quite a few countries. Dollar does really well in Bali. When I went to Bali, baby, some of the best massages I have ever had. I have ever had in this soft skin life. And I have very soft skin, I will say. But the best massages that I think I have ever received were in Bermuda and in Bali. Baby. I got a massage every day that I was in Bali. I was in Bali maybe five days, I think. I think I got like four massages while I was out there. Absolutely divine. Thailand was pretty good also, but not as good as Bali. Baby, $7. 
seven American dollars for an hour of divine massage. And, and afterwards, a nice, fresh, hot ginger tea made with fresh ginger. I had the absolute best experience. And this wasn't even in like a, this wasn't like a fancy schmancy, you know, it was a storefront on the street that I was staying on. It was clean. It was comfortable, but it wasn't like, I don't think it was like a chain destination or anything like that. You get what I'm saying? It wasn't like a spa place. It that had like a ton of other services and a ton, like they did probably facials and massages and stuff like that. Maybe many petties downstairs. Don't really remember because I was stuck on those uh, massages, but $7 massages. So I got a, was it a two bedroom? I think it was like a two bedroom house. I had uh, my own private pool. I had a fish pond right out like in the apartment, like an open fish pond, like in like a kind of room in between the kitchen and like a living space. And I had like a whole second floor bedroom situation with like its own extended balcony that opened up onto a rice field. It was like $25 a night, maybe max. If I'm like really misremembering, maybe $40 a night. But when I tell y'all it was wildly accessible in terms of American money, you can go and get luxury. You can have a really rich experience, but I know good and goddamn well that $40, if we double it to $80, I'm not getting that experience in Paris. I know I'm not getting that experience in LA. You know what I mean? So you really have to keep in mind what you're seeing. Who are you seeing it from? Are you seeing it from a luxury account? Are you seeing it from a uh, Condé Nast? Are you seeing it from travel and leisure? What, where, where are the outlets? Like there are certain things that you should keep in mind when you are forming your expectations on certain destinations that you're going, right? So that's a note on that. What else did I have on here? Oh, um, Grown Up Eve's Bayou definitely gave me a kind of tone for what I was expecting in Louisiana. Um, for when I got down to Nolens, that along with, I feel like in the garden, what was it? Was it midnight in the garden of good and evil? I know that that was set in Savannah cause I had to Google it. That was set in Savannah, but I feel like there was like a Mardi Gras scene. It was one of them, um, Ashley Judd movies. I feel like there was a Mardi Gras scene and I think it was in that. Nope. Double Jeopardy. Double Jeopardy. I'm pretty sure Double Jeopardy was also set in New Orleans because that also had me like that is um that was another like movie that gave me a feel or a tone that I was expecting for New Orleans. True Blood, granted, I did not watch uh True Blood while it was necessarily live. I watched True Blood after the series had completely finished, but I also still watched True Blood probably, <sighs> did I live here? If I live, I feel like I was here when I dove into True Blood. So that was probably sometime 2013 or after, give or take. So it wasn't like forever after it was released. Cause I feel like True Blood was big in like the early 2000s. So maybe like, 10 years after it was a 2003, 2007 kind of thing. No, I don't, I don't remember. Cause again, I didn't watch it while it was live. It just wasn't in my wheelhouse, but I watched it after the fact, loved it. But that also gave me a feeling and a sense for what to look for. And, Ooh, I wonder where this was set. Or I wonder if this place is actually real. Like those movies and shows definitely gave me, um, you know, a mood, a tone, a barometer. There we go. A barometer for what my anticipation of these cities are. Speaking of cities, I will say that Supernatural 
probably one of my top three shows of all time. Huge fan. Jensen Ackles, uh, Jared Padalecki. Love y'all. Gang, gang. Um, Loki Crowley is my favorite character, though. Um, Crowley, Rowena, and Cass. Those are probably the people that I would want to... Um, I'd want to cosplay one of them if I did a Comic-Con. That's another conversation I want to have. I'm curious if anybody's going to Comic-Con. What's your experience been? Who did you dress up as? Did you cosplay? Or did you just show up in jeans and a t-shirt? Um, hit me up. I'm curious. Um, but Supernatural is low-key one of the places or one of the uh, sources of media, if you will, that give me a sense of what um, white America, middle America, uh, sundown towns, perhaps we can, uh, categorize them as places that I necessarily wouldn't go me, this black woman. Um, that is kind of like what I'm not going to hold you. That's kind of what I use as my, Oh, okay. So that's how y'all live over there. That's what the other side of town does. It's a completely fictional, uh, fucking show, but they basically hunt demons and monsters if you're unfamiliar in usually small town America. It's usually, you know, and it's not necessarily like there have been episodes that feature larger cities, but generally they're going to go to, um, oh, like they're from Kansas. What's the, I'm trying to remember like the city that they are from, but of course it's not coming to me right now. Like they, for a couple of seasons, base themselves out of um, the Midwest someplace. And then there's a bunker that's someplace like it's. So when they visit like these little gas stations and the small little towns that they set up shop and stay at these little motels for, this is what I anticipate it to look like. These are the kind of characters and the tropes of people that I expect to be in these locations. And it's, ridiculous i understand that that's a bit of a stretch but again you know i'm not going into a lot of these towns i'm not i don't feel comfortable in small town middle america fuck all of that i'm trying to make it home you know what i mean i'm not trying to have my man fight nobody and he will fight so i don't want to fight because if he's fighting now i'm fighting i don't fight so i'm trying to avoid these problems you feel me so i do not um consciously if you will intentionally spend more time than necessary in areas in my own country um that i'm that i don't know if i will readily find a black and brown um i don't want to necessarily say community because there don't have to be enough in an area to be necessarily considered community, but I would like to see other brown faces. I would like to at least know that I will not, um, cause I can't say I'll be welcome because I, I, being welcome is not the same as permitted, if you will. And I don't mean permitted as in I'm grown. You can't tell me what to do. I'm expressing permission. Black folks. I feel like it's one of those, damn, some, you ever get into those situations where it's just like, it's just some things you don't have to explain. This is one of them things where I feel like I don't have to explain, but for the non-black listeners who may be listening, I don't want y'all totally in the dark. So what I'm trying to say is using a lot of body language here. It's really just some shoulders and hands, but I'm looking for the words. Um, It's one of those things. It's the energy. I'm conscious of the energy around me. I don't like confrontation. I avoid confrontation. So I don't want to be in a situation where I have people questioning me. I don't want to be in a situation because I know that I also have a very uh, strong chance of saying something that may not go over well in every um, situation. And I would like to not put myself in a situation where I have to um, protect myself. I never want to be placed in a situation where I feel I need to defend myself or um, keep people that I care about around me safe. So 
there are communities and towns that I have absolutely no interest in visiting. And when we're doing our road trips, we're very conscious of what time is it? Where are we? What state is this? Where, how far off of the highway do we need to be to get done with what we need to get done? Right. So those are things that I keep in mind when traveling. And a lot of that is colored by, um, not of that, strike that because it's not a lot of that is colored by black ass folks who have told their black ass stories and so i know better than to do um and be certain places but in terms of the places that i won't visit shows like that sons of anarchy that kind of fuckery that's what i'm expecting in these kind of like side of the road uh bars where there ain't much of shit else going on you know what i just watched I just watched, um, what's the movie with the vampires? Um, I don't want to shout out the room to ask him what it is. It's the one with Selma Hayek and is it Antonio Banderas? It's not Once Upon a Time in Mexico. It's the movie where they end up going to, damn, from dusk till dawn. I just watched that for the first time. Um, and there's basically a uh, a bar out in the middle of the desert, and that's where he's supposed to meet um, his friend. And see, now that's some shit that I would never do. But shows like Supernatural, movies like that, that gives me what I would assume happens in places like that. And that is a strong reason why I wouldn't go someplace like that. Not to say that there's going to be a vampire um outbreak and they're going to try to you know kill us at the bar but you never fucking know there's also people that don't want me and my partner together who is very mixy we are a mixed couple they don't necessarily want to see us together so you feel me safety first safety fucking first because he doesn't play so we don't want those um i protect mine i don't put him in situations that we got to get him out of logic right uh what's the last one i wanted to touch on skip 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 uh you know what ron brown gave me um quite the vision if you will of what i was expecting rome to look like so uh da vinci code thank you tom hanks um i want to say angels and demons was also set in rome uh i visited rome i think back i don't know because apparently four years ago today i was in shanghai um thank you social media for that reminder and another thing i need to start doing is wondering whether or not like i because like a year from now if i were to repost that photo and I see a year from now that I posted that photo of me in Shanghai. It's just like, well, five years from now, I think that I was in Shanghai this year because I reposted it then and it says five years ago. You get what I'm saying? But um, anywho, Rome, I can't really say outside of US, not US history uh, class, um, world history in high school, Roman empires, Greek gods, goddesses. It was really Da Vinci Code. My mom and I read them books. They were so damn good. So good. Um, But we read the Da Vinci Code books, enjoyed those, so absolutely had to watch the movie. And low-key, that is basically what I was expecting of the Vatican and, um, well, Vatican City, uh, which is, I want to say its own country state or it's its own independent nation, I want to say, but not, it's kind of like DC. So it's like not technically a state, but it's its own thing. I think it might actually be its own country though. But anyway, Vatican, Vatican City, um, and Rome, I really got, I, what I anticipated was Da Vinci Code. Not even going to lie. Um, got there. Oh, you know what else I watched? What's that Aziz Ansari show that Lena Waithe was in that just came to mind? I feel like I watched season 
two first and then I watched season one and I don't remember which season it was, but I feel like he was um, learning how to make pasta in Italy somewhere. So like a little bit of that, but mostly um, Da Vinci Code is what I was expecting Rome to be like. I won't sit, I wasn't out, you know, solving puzzles and shit, but what I will say very, very strongly remember being not disappointed, but like underwhelmed with a lot of the places, especially like the Parthenon. Like my library at back at home is larger than this, I think, ain't it? It just looked so small compared to what I was expecting. I was expecting something as large and grandiose as the Coliseum. Not the case. Um, additionally, I was what I think it's called the mouth of truth that um little site where you put your hand in like this big stone face and I was expecting it to be grander than it was and it was just like a piece of art like you know what I mean it just looked like an art installation on the wall and I guess it's cool because it was what I guess it's super old don't fucking know It just, honestly, I was the most enthralled by a random chapel. Like there was a random church someplace that I was walking. I went to Vatican City and then I went to St. Peter's Basilica. So I was there and what I should have done was gone to see the Sistine Chapel first because that closed earlier than St. Peter's Basilica. But I didn't know. Wasn't thinking that far in advance. Didn't expect to spend as much time as I did in St. Peter's Basilica. But on my way out of there, I was just randomly walking around looking for something to eat because it was roughly three, four o'clock. I was surprised that, you know, it wasn't going to be open. Or or was I wrong? And it was later than that. I don't know. But whatever time it was, shit was fucking open. So I started walking around trying to find something to eat. And I ended up just randomly walking into um, a church, like tucked away next to some other larger thing. And that's another thing. I feel like people just start taking random pictures of big grandiose things, thinking that it's something important and then thinking, Oh, I'll figure out what it is later. I know I used to do that. I would randomly take pictures of just buildings that look nice or entrances and stuff that, Oh, maybe this is something. Let's take a picture. I never go back to the photos and really see if, let me see if I can Google this uh, image and see if it's actually a thing or look on the map. I never follow up, but One of the places that really stood out to me was like a random fucking church. It was just so gorgeous. I just walked around and looked at the different um, stations of the cross. Born and bred Catholic. Um, I am not a practicing Catholic anymore. Um, Shout out to those of you that are. Shout out to those of you that, you know, love your religion. I love what it does for you. Just not really my thing. But I do enjoy churches because that's one thing I think people do across all denominations They will praise their God through beautiful fucking buildings. And baby, churches are gorgeous. Whatever, temples, mosques, you name it. Um, The, where was the place? In Big Buddha. In, where was that? In Thailand. And then I went to that huge mosque in... Casablanca and then what was the other one that was really really pretty it was also like a really gorgeous gorgeous church in Costa Rica I just really love churches um or just religious buildings in general they tend they're just gorgeous so I will pop in respectfully um and just sit in the back or if it is not in use or if there is not if I won't be a disturbance to what's going on and if it's welcomed or invited I'll just walk around and look at the different um statues and all the other kind of jazz that um worshipers practitioners alike will uh adorn these uh I don't really want to call them buildings but they're buildings with um but still that to say a lot of times what you expect to be something big and grandiose and it's important. Ooh la la. And then you get there and the stuff that everybody's hyping up isn't. And then you end up finding something small, nondescript and falling in love with it. So that is testaments just being open to the experience and being present. So one thing that I will definitely caution people to 
in terms of travel is to not let what your, um, I don't want to say your social media vision because it's not relegated just to social media. And I don't want to give social media a negative connotation as being the one reason why people feel a way or see and anticipate something. A lot of the tourist places that we visit, spoiler, don't look shit like what they do in the photos. One big misconception that I was very surprised by was in Bali. I ended up going to, I do not know how to pronounce the temple, um, but it's one of those temples that have like the gates to heaven is, I want to say in English, which you can kind of Google to um, get the picture of what I'm looking, what I'm trying to describe. But they used, they were very popular during the um, 2017s, I'd say between like 2015 and 20. 20 probably, right? I'd say definitely 2015, 16. I saw a ton of them on Instagram, probably through like maybe 2018, actually. I'd say that in terms of um, my noticing um, the photos. But it was there, everybody would have like that beautiful picture of them doing like a yoga pose or just something meditative or reflective and just cute, if you will, with that beautiful backdrop. And the reflection and you're thinking that it's like, um, water and all that. No, it's somebody that's actually holding like a piece of foil or a piece of material to create the illusion of a reflection of, or of like a reflective surface water or whatever. And it's camera angles. You literally stand on a line in the fucking heat waiting to take that photo well, it is and granted it can be a very beautiful photo and I'm alas it drew me in I went to go see what the buzz was and what the hype about it was and it was I saw what it was and I'm like oh I'm good on that I'm absolutely good here this beautiful temple in front of us these beautiful mountains surrounding us this is special land people come here to worship and to pray and to grieve and then seeing like right across from this temple where people are actively using it you know a mass queue of just tourists just look at me it was really disappointing and that was one of those first for me aha kind of moments, if you will, or one of those, you know, the, the curtain getting pulled back and you're looking into, you know, the setup of it all and the mystery and mystique is taken away. But, um, it happens in a lot of different places. There are no countries that are not going to use tourists and our ignorance, uh, for their own personal and financial gain. So keep your head on a swivel, protect your neck, protect your coin, and also just go and be present. People live in these places. People share love and grief and excitement and worry and anticipation, joy. All They experience all the things, all the shit that you are running away from <laughs> at home or running back to after your trips is going on where you're at. It's going on where you're visiting. Keep that in mind. Go into it with enough kind of uh, enough of a picture that you'll be safe, right? Go into, like, don't travel to, you know, certain countries where you know you may be unsafe. If you are visibly homosexual, if you are traveling with your partner, or if you were visibly queer, or if you were just visibly living in your truth and your accepted life, that is something that you have to consider. Scrolling back to, I want to say it's episode three or four. Shout out to Kenna. I met one of the most incredible souls in my solo travels. We met in Cuba and baby, they are such a light and they've been going on an incredible journey that has been so interesting to watch. But in that episode, they talked about having to kind of be hyper aware of the different countries they were visiting because they are visibly queer and they don't want to be in spaces where they 
don't feel like they will be, um, again, that word welcomed where they will be allowed in peace. Like you don't want to go someplace where you can't just fucking exist. And then there was also a couple of opportunities, not opportunities, but experiences where they were saying where they were expecting some things to be a little tense. And then sometimes it actually wasn't and it was a little more comfortable than they anticipated but that was a really interesting episode so double back to that one one of the baby traveling shit um episodes uh but you gotta be considerate enough or you need to be mindful enough both honestly consider enough to know a little something about the place you're going but not in the sense of where you have your mind set up and then you've got these grandiose expectations that are going to, you know, keep you from being present in the moment. So as we're wrapping it up with a solo episode, this episode happens to actually be an episode where I will have a listener question. Ah, special effect. There was no special effect. I was just shaking for the camera. Um, so I had a really great question. There's still not a name for this segment. Listener question. Um, we'll get around to it at some point. The point is the value. The point is the value. So this week's question comes from like the bridge, like the bridge. Hey girl. Uh, thank you for this question. Cause this was a really, really good question. I enjoyed it. What self-care items do you bring on solo trips? Candles, journals, etc. So glad you asked. Um, I, and also I will be DMing you. I uh, will send you your code for your free merch. So thank you again for participating. And as a reminder, on Fridays, I post on the social medias, a little, uh, free space for you guys to drop some questions for me to be asked in this listener question segment and to the listeners that do participate when I do use your question I send you free travel and shit merch so please hit me up on the socials uh on Friday when I post that so I actually have some of my personal items here that I travel with because yes your girl does travel with a journal always 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 I don't always use it, but I know that it's one of those things where if I didn't bring it, that's when I would absolutely want to use it. So I'd rather have it and not need it versus, um, or not use it than want to use it and not have it. So I actually have two journals that I, uh, swap between carrying. And these are my travel journals where I like to have space to kind of just write out like episode ideas or like I tend to, you're in a new surrounding, you're in a new environment. There are new, um, you know, thoughts and feelings and you see new things, you meet new people and you want just some place to write it down. I absolutely enjoy having the space to write things down by hand, whether it be a doodle, words, just needing to get certain ideas out, or I want to get certain feelings out in terms of how a trip has made me feel checking in with myself. I do my best to be mindful for every trip. And sometimes I go the extra mile and actually do journal or write some things down. And so this is one of the journals, my carry on finesse God journal. Uh, this is about available on the travel and shit, uh, website. So this is a fun hardcover, uh, journal, cute little QR code that, um, Ooh, actually thinking of a new idea mental noting, but that uh, QR code, I want to say brings you to the podcast or to the website, but I also have this journal. I don't know if you guys can see it behind me pulling this out. I think this one is a little bit smaller. Yes, it is. This one is a bit smaller than the other journal, but this is also another little cutie pie that I often bring with me on my travels. Same thing. I like to just be able to write things down just because handwriting sometimes is cathartic. I enjoy being able to get things out in writing. What I also travel uh, with is a small sage wand and either a lighter or matches. If I'm in continental um, United States or anywhere in North America, honestly, I will not think twice about bringing lighters. 
but I know certain countries will run your shit. Uh, I think China was one of the places where they were serious about, no, we really need no lighters. So matches, also useful. But I'll bring a sage wand with me because the last thing that I want is to ever get to uh, an accommodation and to immediately feel unsafe or immediately feel like there's an energy or a presence there that doesn't um, vibe with me being there. So I, um, or just someone else's grief, someone else's sorrow or someone else's ill intentions. I don't fucking know what I'm gonna walk into. So I always like to have something that will at least give me peace in its usage, whether y'all believe in it or not. I am, um, if nothing else, a proponent of, oh, there was a word for it of fragrance. Um, like auditory is what you hear visual is something that you see. Oh, the word is like right at the tip of my nose. Um, funny that that's the body part I use and not my tongue. Right. But, um, shit i'm trying to it's like a sneeze it's right here since i enjoy um aromatherapy i enjoy like certain fragrances bring me calm so as opposed to bringing an entire diffuser i will often bring a sage wand and i will also i haven't done it very recently um because a lot of times loki i'm gonna hold you i don't want to burn nobody shit down And I know that on vacations, I tend to be very carefree. But if I were going back to, say, um, Bali, or if I were going back to someplace where I intended intentionally to do a lot of movement and um, yoga, per se, more on that in a second, (laughs) our sponsor, Bedside Globe Hansel, actually has the cutest and the tiniest travel-friendly little candles for y'all to travel with. So uh, be sure to uh, use your travel and shit discount, TNS20 and Bedside Glow. Um, Is it Bedside Glow or Bedside Glow candles? Let me look that up real quick just to make sure that y'all ain't doing it wrong because baby, they're winners, okay? These candles smell so great. Bedside... Yep. Bedsideglow.com. That's what it is. Not Bedside Glow Candles, but Bedsideglow.com. Use your code TNS20 for a discount on your order. And this is Heart Chakra. Yes. This one is Heart Chakra and Nick. God damn, that smells good. Heart Chakra and Nag Champ are two of my favorite fragrances. They smell so freaking good. And to the extent, and they don't just smell good because a lot of candles smell good, but then don't burn well. And then you don't smell anything when you burn them. And I've been burning that candle for a while. Even the small ones last extensively. Like they have a really long burn time. I don't have a number on it, but I want to say off and on, I've been burning that candle maybe since June. Okay. Um, so of course, within reason, you're not going to burn it for 12 hours, six days in a row. It's like three ounces. So, um, let's be real. But if you're going to use it for a little bit of, um, centering or grounding yourself, say first thing in the morning, sit and have a cup of coffee, the fragrance is fragrancing. Um, but I know smell can absolutely calm me and you know kind of bring me to a a space that I want to be in terms of well for not in terms but for creating and for getting into uh, a certain headspace I also bring leggings it doesn't necessarily seem like a self-care item but for me it is just because I absolutely hate being uncomfortable and I hate being cold so sometimes the AC on an apartment or a, a space that you're staying isn't really responsive to me turning it up or I tend to get cold. I don't want to be cold when I am asleep or if I'm just walking around the property or if I just wanted to run out and grab some coffee, whatever. I like having something that I know I will always be comfor- comfortable in regardless. I also like having the option to move. 
I love walking. I do truly enjoy hiking. Um, and I feel like having a pair of leggings with me brings me that kind of assurance that should the spirit strike, I am prepared. Should my body really want to move in those spaces, I have something there. If I wanted to get on the floor and bust out, you know, chaturanga pose, uh, downward dog, child, all of it. Shout out to Lisa and my yoga, baby, I'm back this week. Um, but I know that I've got what I need to get that done. And honestly, you can do yoga in anything. But for me, I always feel better with a pair of leggings. And after also making it to Bermuda with, I think, I think I only had like one pair of leggings and I ended up really packing for hot weather and I got lukewarm weather. So baby, them leggings came in clutch because that was the only thing keeping my legs warm when the sun went down and I still wanted to do something outside at night. So leggings are important to me in terms of self-care because they bring me peace of mind that I know I'm going to be comfortable even if it is a little cold. It's kind of like a sweater for my legs, if you will. I know that I'll just throw on a pair of leggings and whatever top I can I've got with me. Um, and also for the availability of movement for act, um, activity and active, um, active activities, hiking, the yogas. Is that what I had on my list? I want to say that's pretty much it. Honestly, sage matches, journal candle and leggings. Yeah. Oh, also, um, Evian face spray. So I hate dry ass and you should all hate dry ass airplane air. Thankfully, I haven't been on any super long flights, but especially for the long flights, I actually saw uh, recently on social media, poor baby. Turns out this person in particular has a lot of allergies and things that fuck with them and they looked gorgeous and, you know, skin on 10 in the photo, in the videos before the plane got on that plane. I think she said like two hours later face swollen up. She had super huge, dark patches under her eyes. She has eczema and that dry air really, really baby, the business, that poor baby. I hope she was able to kind of, you know, fight through it, but she looked so uncomfortable. And I love that little Evian face spray because I will pull that mask down real quick, spritz, spritz, make sure we are hydrated put the mask back on and then go to sleep. Um, or just spray around the fucking mask. Let's spray the, the space up here. These, the eyes, the forehead, let's get a little bit of neck decolletage if it's exposed. Um, also super clutch in hot weather pro tip, keep it in the fucking fridge. But, um, yeah, I love traveling with, uh, a little bit of that little, toiletry bag size we ended up and by we i mean dell bought it for me hey best friend uh we were some we were at the mall in new orleans uh during the essence fest fest trip i want to say it was might have been tj maxx you know how they have all those little like when you go to ulta they have all of those all the stores that have the shit by the register that really just rope you in. Well, there was a two pack of the Evian face spray. And so she got us, she got us the sprays. Um, but I do enjoy having that with me as well as like a portable Lysol spray, as well as a portable pack of uh, like pack of wipes. I it, love having a, when I travel, especially a road trip, any trip, honestly, I bring a regular package of wipes, like the big, 200 and the package wipes, but I also bring the smaller personal. I want to say, I think it's the Kirkland brand jumbo, like the economy box of wipes. I feel like they come with like a smaller packet of like 16 or 24. I love traveling with those so that I have those in my purse for like airport bathrooms. Just like, I don't need, I'm not bringing my duffel bag with me if boyfriend is waiting with the bags. But like, if I'm going someplace, a lot of countries, uh, what do you call it? Toilet paper is not the norm. It's just not, you have to have your own toilet paper. So I like having the pack of wipes, especially the smaller personal pack so that I could travel with that. And I'm always be taken care of to the, to the level that 
my personal hygiene calls for. That makes me comfortable. I like being comfortable and those are things that make me comfortable. So I definitely travel with um, a pack of wipes also. So uh, those are my personal care items that I always travel with. Directing you to travelshippodcast.com, going to the shop tab, um, my newsletter um, members get a discount for being part of the newsletter family. And um, you can use it on travel journals should you choose. And don't forget your discount with this segment's sponsor, Bedside Glow. TNS20 is the discount. And the website is bedsideglow.com. So you can get your perfect for travel size candle and um, get into that, um, that aromatherapy on your travels. And that's it for this week's episode, guys. I hope you got the gist of travel being so much more than vacation this week. And I hope you are back with me next week to dive into another episode that will touch on the different ways that travel intersects with regular life. All right, y'all. Bye.